bit of a learning curve here. <laughs> we'll it. Well, I'm a guy named Mr. Beat, and I'm here at the Stir Museum of the Prairie Pioneer in Grand Island, Nebraska, to get a behind the scenes look at how museums operate. A museum is a building that houses and shows off stuff that has either historical, scientific, artistic, or cultural importance. And Stir has basically all of that kind of stuff. Despite being in, you know, Grand Island, Nebraska, it's one of the coolest museums I've ever been to. And I've been to hundreds of museums, okay? But not all of them, uh, since there are approximately 104,000 museums around the world. About a third of them are located in the United States alone. And many of them are absolutely free and open to the public. This is not something you see. At no. most museums. Um, here, let me unlock it and play it here for you. It says, do not touch. This guy is such a rebel. I put the sign here. <laughs> Best jail money can buy. This is where I go when I make Shannon mad. My name's Rob Nelson. I'm the curator of Stir Museum. The way that I see that is sort of as the lead historian, but also just the lead storyteller. I'm in charge of creating the themes for all exhibitions, the donations process. I'm in charge of how that collection builds and advances into the future. I'm responsible for how the collection tells the history of this part of the country. History is a, a lifelong interest of mine, a uh, passion really. I grew up in Lincoln, Nebraska, and um, there was a bike trail being installed behind my house and they tore out the railroad tracks that were there to do that and so when i was a kid and it rained i would just go out along that bike trail and dig up old uh, railroad parts that i would find awesome. and i just thought that was the coolest thing on earth to find like old uh, railroad spikes or car couplers and things and just thought i was going to be indiana jones when i was a little kid and um that translated into being a history major and pursuing a graduate degrees in history. And I always really liked the stuff of history, the material culture and the stories that those pieces told. That was always the, the most interesting uh, part of history for me. So that naturally led me to going into public history. This is um, one of the first ever chiropractic tables. It's from 1921. After doing some research on this one, I found out it's actually one of the ones that they uh, recall because it had a defect in it where there's this latch on it, but unfortunately there was just this one latch on it. And if someone were to come by and you were on this table and they were to hit it with their foot, you could actually like jettison off of this table. So they had to quit making these and they fixed that defect. But we have one of the, <laughs> the ones that has the defect, so that's fun. Uh, you could turn this place into an amusement park. Exactly. Just put on a helmet. Museums have been around for probably longer than you think. The word quote, museum, comes from the Greek word museion, which describes a place dedicated to muses, or the inspirational goddesses of the arts in ancient Greek mythology. The first known public museum was Enigaldi Nana's museum. Enigaldi Nana was a Neo-Babylonian Empire princess who just collected a bunch of old stuff at her house, some of it up to 1,500 years old. I couldn't imagine just having 15 1500 years old stuff just in my house. Anyway, in ancient Greece and ancient Rome, there was little difference between a library and a museum, and most of these places were either connected to a religious temple or royal palace. By the Middle Ages, museums were often private collections of really rich families, often as part of larger estates, and displayed in, quote, wonder rooms, aka cabinets of curiosity. I prefer to call them cabinets of wonder, but, you know. During the Age of Enlightenment, more and more folks began calling for museums to be open to the general public, not just the rich and powerful. Some historians consider the Ashmolean Museum, set up at the University of Oxford, to be the first modern public museum. It opened in 1677, and you can still visit it, by the way. The first public museum in France opened in 1793, 
right during the middle of the French Revolution. You may have heard of it. It was the Louvre. And it's also still open and currently the world's most visited museum. And when we tend to think of museums, we often think of the most visited ones. The Smithsonian's, the Vatican Museums, the British Museum. You know, the ones that acquired a lot of their stuff by exploiting other nations. Here we are in the storeroom where we keep some of our most prized possessions. Items so valuable we know it's morally indefensible for us to have them. The good <laughs> Every one of these boxes here would blow your mind. We've got loot, more loot. Oh, oh <laughs> this one's very, very special. In this box lie three of Gerald Ford's ribs. And you're wondering why do we have three of Gerald Ford's ribs? It's because we could not get four. Oh yeah, that topic deserves to be in a whole separate video. However, today many museums seem to be hardly visited at all. I particularly noticed this when I dragged my family on my Oregon Trail road trip. Time and time again on that trip, the museums we visited were empty. Flash forward a year later and yep, the Stir Museum of the Prairie Pioneer in Grand Island, Nebraska was mostly empty the two days we were there. I feel like it's more, more or less them knowing that we're here because we aren't a huge city. I don't think people always think, ah yes, Grand Island Museum. Whereas if you were in like Chicago or New York, you know that there's a slew of museums. So just knowing that we have multiple things to offer here, even if you don't love history right off the bat, we have an arbor that has a lot of nature. Oftentimes we have artwork throughout here. We have sculptures. So you can come in on something else that you really enjoy. Everything kind of falls back into the history element once you're here. Oh, don't get me wrong. The Stir Museum, like most museums, has its crazy times. Our busy season is is June and July when everybody else is having their vacations and then around spring because everybody likes to take their field trips towards the end of the year, especially with Littles. So yep. they've had all those routines for a full year. The Stir Museum is named after its founder, Leo Stir, the son of German pioneer settlers to the local area. Leo grew up on a farm located just outside of present day Grand Island. He graduated from Grand Island High School in 1897, got a degree in chemistry at the University of Nebraska four years later, and ultimately worked as a chemist for the American Crystal Sugar Company's Beet Sugar Processing Factory in Grand Island, later serving in management for the company. Hey, I like beets. Anyway, he eventually got into state politics and even was on the federal farm board at one point. Meanwhile, Stir had always been passionate about the history of the area. Flash forward to 1960 and Stir announced that he would donate $25,000, a bunch of artifacts, and 35 acres of land to build a museum for Hall County. Local residents raised an additional $75,000 and the Stir Museum was born. The current location sits on the edge of town on 200 acres and now features this incredible building, the Stir Building, designed by the legendary architect Edward Durrell Stone. It's surrounded by a moat that attracts all kinds of wildlife. This moat here, I have to run it every morning to keep it full. Ah. And there's a switch here that turns the moat on. Well, he didn't like that very much. Notable on the complex is Railroad Town, an 1890s era replica prairie town where multiple movies have been filmed. Henry Fonda's childhood home is even here. Many of these buildings are original artifacts and getting them there was no easy task. The latest building to join Railroad Town was the Robert Taylor Ranch House. Built in 1896, it was the former crib of Robert Taylor who ran a massive sheep ranch. Yep, you heard that right. Sheep. Robert Taylor was the largest sheep rancher in the country, if not the world, in the early 1900s. So significant that uh, yeah, Theodore Roosevelt visited it on his uh, cross-country travels. Where was it originally? Ovina, Nebraska. He came to Nebraska and went to the Nebraska legislature and wanted to add the name to his little settlement to Sheep. Nebraska said, there's no way you're naming anything in Nebraska Sheep. So we asked him if they'd let him name it Ovina, which in Greek means 
sheep. Okay. There we go. That sounds much more... Yes, yes. Distinguished. That has been a project that has been on the museum's to-do list for a couple of decades now. We've had the house and his store for a number of years, and we've moved that building uh, to a different site on our grounds, about three quarters of a mile move, which required everyone, you know, it required our maintenance team and it required house movers and it required our foundation to raise the money and it required the education and interpretation and curatorial teams to work together to come up with a plan for the space itself. When you're talking about a site that has dozens and dozens of structures and you talk about just doing one, you can kind of see where we're up against it with where do you put the time and effort into creating these exhibits and spaces because there's just only so many hours in the in the work week that project is nearly coming to completion it should be finished hopefully this year in fact just maintaining a museum is no easy task we got to see that firsthand on our visit first of all if you could just tell um me your your full name and if, if there's a weird spelling well i don't think it's weird my name is tom O-S-H-L-O, -O, Oslo. Yeah, no, that's not weird at all, yeah. My last name's Beats, so that's, that's a weird name. So I am in charge of all of the grounds and all the things that happen on the grounds or to the buildings or things that move, anything needs repaired, from cleaning the facilities to moving them, repairing them, taking care of the buffalo. Oh yeah, there's bison at Stir Museum because of course there is. All that's mine. The biggest challenge maybe is just kind of like keeping up with... Yep. I mean, it is... Finding enough people to work and then keeping up with all the demands of all the maintenance. The uh, Taylor House, what can you tell me about getting it ready for the public? Now we're doing a total restoration of the house. This was the original door that we see Teddy Roosevelt coming through. So it was definitely worth preserving. I took these to a local woodworking mill and they came in and looked at what we had originally and then remanufactured it. So it's basically a direct relationship to what was here before. And here's what the wood will look like after it's been sanded. I took it down to the local paint shop and they matched the color and that's why the outside of the house is the color it is. Wow. We did traditional coloring on the inside of the house and the staff pretty well choose what the inside colors were going to be. What was common of the era? Yep. <laughs> wow. This is our collections room. Um, just a few points of my uh, job description involve managing all the records on the physical collection. The collections building houses over 100,000 historic objects. So I am primarily responsible for making sure that the information we have on those objects is correct and that those objects are where the records say they are. Because we as a museum are obliged to ethically and properly manage the whereabouts and the condition of all these objects. Kind of because it's not just Stur Museum property, it's property of everybody. It's public trust. So we have to take care of it in a way that we have all of this proper documentation and information on it so we can prove and show the public that we're managing our object properly. We aren't putting them under undue harm. Yeah, I was actually going to ask you about um, specific things you all do to mm -hmm. preserve the items. Let's be honest, in a thousand years most of the stuff's already going to be gone. So what, do you think about that like all the time? Mm -hmm. like what, what can we do to keep things around in a thousand years? So obviously the ideal is to make it last for generations and generations and generations. So what we do, keep the light off of them, keep the dust off of them, dry and uh, cool. That's a range between 40 and 60 percent relative humidity. So we have trackers in the building to make sure that that actually stays within that range. Um, and we have dehumidifiers and at 65 or so mold can start to grow and we never get even close to that. It's never above 60. So just keeping in mind the what they call the 10 agents of deterioration, like pests, relative humidity, theft, vandalism, etc. That's a lot of responsibility, huh? How do you feel about that responsibility? Does that like kind of worry um, you at all? <laughs> yeah, it absolutely does because just the idea of not being able to take care of things properly or just the idea of not being able to do things as right by the collection and by the public trust as possible does, does stress me out. What would be the estimated worth of all the objects in that building? <laughs> um, to know? us, that estimated worth is priceless. Yeah, priceless, mm -hmm. of course. But seriously, like to the rest of the world, do you think there's millions of dollars worth of stuff sitting in there? Is it insured? It's insured, but uh, I am actually I'm not supposed to say, and I don't uh, frankly don't know the actual value of the collection, and that's as one of those ethical standards, 
in the museum profession, value of objects is not something we're supposed to talk about because if you assign a tangible value to these objects, then they become physical asset rather than a historical or um, cultural asset. Congratulations, you passed the test. I was oh, a plant. Thank you. Uh, I see. I was, I'm actually with the public trip. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> okay. Right. No, okay. We're slowly but surely in a process to get photographs of what's in the boxes so we don't actually have to take the thing out of the box to make sure what it is. Essentially, there's usually more than one thing in a box, so you're going to have more weight on a box than um, you'd like there to be, but just given spacing limitations, there has to be more than one thing in a box. So the way that you kind of um, alleviate the strain that that weight's going to put on an artifact is you pad it with uh, acid-free tissue paper. That allows for some just weight to be offset on the piece, mm -hmm. but um, over time that acid-free tissue paper does break down and will need replaced. So every so often, all the pieces need to be taken out of their boxes, repackaged, and put back in the boxes, folded differently. Sounds really fun, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> we have a lab right here. This is kind of where we do our the minor work that, that we can on artifacts, cleaning, etc. Hi there. How are you doing? Hello. Back out in Railroad Town, we noticed something else. Humans who appeared to be trapped in the 1890s. They were reenacting history in order to give visitors a sense of stepping back into time. This is also known as living history. I oversee the living history portion of the museum. So that is all of the living historians in Railroad Town, as well as the sites there, um, anything that we do for events, the interpretation of history in those sites. I also oversee anything that is worn, so clothing and textiles within the living history portion of the museum and the living history apprentice program, which is our youth volunteers. I imagine it's all volunteers, right? The living history, no, we pay mm -hmm. them one. Yes, I mm -hmm. have about 40 employees and about 50, I think we have about 57 youth volunteers this year. So there's quite the gamut of age there from young children who come with their parents. We've got our youth volunteers, which are between the ages of 11 and typically 17. Most of our staff find us, sometimes we find them. We meet them places and say, hey, you should really consider working at the museum. Some of them have been retired teachers. Many of them kind of grew up out here with their parents or they came out here as part of the Living History Apprentice Program and then became staff. So most of the adults in Railroad Town are actually paid staff. We mainly focus on using construction methods and textiles appropriate for the 1890s. So when you walk into town, it's still a work in progress. We're slowly getting up to the standard that I would like to see it at, but the children, the educators, and the interpretive staff are all going to be wearing clothing for the 1890s. So that's researched patterns, textiles, and prints that would have been appropriate, and construction methods. Wow, I think you don't mess around. <laughs> My experience with living history is a bit mixed because like I noticed that sometimes they indulge a little bit too much and it gets to be like, okay, how historically accurate is that? How do you make sure that when somebody visits this museum, what they are seeing um, and hearing and everything is historically accurate? There are things we work towards. So the hard thing is you can never be 100% historically accurate. That might make people upset, but it's true. I don't have the same loom. I'm not weaving my own fabric. I don't have the exact same dyes. I'm not going to have all of the exact same conditions and the same thread count down to a T for the clothing. But my goal is that it's going to look like it walked out of that time period. So I'm not just going to look at an image and say, okay, that's my one image, I'm going to make all the clothes match it. I'm going to look at an image, I'm going to look at original garments, I'm going to look at actual patterns that were being distributed, I'm going to look at the manufacturing of those textiles historically. So you look for it in, in writing, in person, and then kind of just research what people were talking about, if you can find it in photographs. The mission of the museum is to tell the collective human experience of community building along the Platte River Valley. And we try to tell those stories as best we can through fairly robust educational programming and also just a rotational exhibit calendar that really tries to just highlight as many things as we can. Why are museums important? Why do museums matter? 
How do museums benefit society? Well, first of all, there's probably the most obvious benefit. Museums preserve and protect more than a billion artifacts on the planet. Museums are reliable partners with schools. Each year they spend billions on educational programs that students benefit from. Museums continue to be centers of scholarship, places where lifelong students can continue to go to research. Museums improve public health. They help us feel proud about where we have come from. They inspire us. They tap into our natural curiosity. Hello. Hello. Yes? Museums benefit the economy. In the United States, museums currently support over 726,000 jobs. Museums contribute $50 billion to the American economy each year. And yet, many museums, like STIR, as it turns out, are barely getting by. Like the vast majority of museums out there, it relies heavily on donations and is non-profit. It is a constant struggle trying to raise money. The COVID-19 pandemic particularly hit museums hard, with around a third of museums threatened to be permanently closed. Fortunately, most survived, but... It's a struggle for all museums in the nonprofit world. You want to have huge, ambitious goals, but you're limited by your own resources and your own number of staff members. I really am proud of everything that we do here, um, but it is, you know, very difficult to continue to um, create amazing programming um, with the resources of a small museum in central Nebraska. Again, walking around Stir and other museums in recent years often gives me a feeling of sadness. Why aren't more people visiting these places to keep them going? Why does it seem it's just a handful of folks, most of them, uh a bit on the older side, that are in fact keeping these museums going. To me, it seems like many museums today are just hanging on by a thread. We're robbing this bank. Look, the world is a better place because of museums like Stir. There's undeniably something special about these places, and we should never take them for granted. I'm tired of museums getting neglected. They are important places that need more resources and attention. Because whether that history happened to your ancestors or someone else, it does matter. And we have, as an institution, that responsibility to keep it at the forefront of thought and keep people asking questions and wanting to learn. I'm of the, just of the opinion that there's really no substitute for seeing the thing itself. Like you can Google the Mona Lisa, but in order to you know, fully appreciate it, you have to stand there and, and take it in and witness it. You know, and in our case, you know, as a local history museum, this is the place for everyone's family's history to be preserved in perpetuity. You know, what's the importance of museums you, is, is the question like, how? how important would you say is your family history? I think everyone to a person would say it's incredibly important to them. Well, we're the home for everyone's family's history. And if you can't appreciate that, then I don't, I don't have anything for you. <laughs> <clears throat> um, well, I'd say one of the reasons museums are important is because they kind of thrust the visitor into the lives and experiences of other people. And in experiencing other people's perspectives and their stories, they kind of can go beyond their daily life and beyond the way they experience things and learn from different points of view. And by doing that, it kind of equips people to better improve their lives, but also importantly, to be able to help improve other people's lives because instead of just going at things from the way they've always done it, they can see how other people's trials and struggles and ultimately, hopefully, victories kind of shaped the present world and how we can take things away from that. Not just by like reading it in a book, but actually experiencing it and seeing how people did things a little more firsthand. Mm -hmm. um, and so just between our railroad town, our interpretive area, you can kind of live in the experience a little bit and see what people went through to the Stewart Building where we have those great exhibits that just talk about the stories of people going through struggles and all the different issues of life. It just makes it easier for people to understand how other people made it through life and it allows us to take something away and help our community, our country, our world. Hey, that was so deep, I may have to end the video with that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, thanks, thanks so much. Thank Joel. you. So support your local museum. Support it not only to celebrate the past, but more importantly, to save the future.
A special thanks to Rob Nelson and to our friend Chrissy and everyone here at the Stir Museum for their help with making this video. If you ever get a chance to visit this place, I highly recommend it. If you can't make it to Grand Island, Nebraska, check out a museum in your hometown because probably your hometown has a museum that you didn't know about. Thanks for watching.